This podcast is made possible by Cloud Microphones, makers of Cloudlifter mic activators. Want to hear more of what your favorite dynamic and ribbon mics really sound like? Check out the entire line of Cloudlifters and get lifted. Learn more at cloudmicrophones.com. Hey, it's Larry Crane. Welcome to the Tape Op Podcast. We interview producer-engineer Jonathan Schenke in November 2017 for Tape Op Issue 122. But since that time, he has moved studios, formed new recording and performance projects, and been part of a bunch of new records. Online publisher Jeff Stanfield caught up with Jonathan recently at his new Brooklyn-based studio, Windows. Enjoy. Well, cool. Thanks for taking the, the time to Dude, sit down again. I know we, we interviewed you a few issues back. Yeah. Yeah, that was at my old space, Dr. Wu's. Yeah. Um, so it's it's cool to, to have you over here at Studio Windows. I know you did a lot of live sound as you got you know older and into the scene and started getting more interested in recording, but what was your initial interest in music? How did you sort of find your your way Pre live music. I mean, pre you pre live sound. Pre live yeah. sound. Yeah. I mean, some of my earliest memories are music related. My my parents uh, both like sing in the choir still. And my mom is a really gifted pianist, but like some of my I remember uh, the Planets by Gustav Holtz and you know Beethoven's Fifth, like having going and putting the record on and like cranking the volume knob, you know, which in my mind is like took up the whole hand as like a (laughs) four year old child and just like cranking the volume and like running out of the room before like bum, 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 bum hit. And that was like my idea of fun. Um, So it was, was, there was always music in the house and uh, you know, being, in elementary school and discovering Sgt. Pepper's and, you know, in my uncle's collection and just becoming obsessed with the Beatles. And I feel like my entire childhood, I was an avid fan of music and, you know, played in the garage with a couple buddies, but never really, there was some like gap between being a fan of music and being a maker of music. And it wasn't until I was in college uh, and I quit the computer science program that I was like, oh, well, what do I actually want to do? Like, if I don't want to program computers, you know, for this semester, I probably don't want a degree and I definitely don't want to do it for the rest of my life. Like, what do I actually want to be doing? And, you know, figured out that I could make up a major and get into the recording program at the Cleveland Institute of Music um, without being a classically trained performer. Were, and were you playing music as a kid? A little bit. Like I had piano lessons, I sang in choir. Uh, I had like bass guitar and um, you know would like jam with people but i never really it's what i'm saying it, there was this weird like gap in realization that like oh i could get a four track like i didn't have buddies that had four tracks or like you know i grew up in the 90s so like the groove boxes like that would have cracked my my skull open you know right. i feel like that that would have been the perfect introduction but i didn't have anyone any friends or like elders that were like, yo, you should check this thing out. So it took that like inward, like deep stare my freshman year of college of like, actually all I want to do is make records. I don't even know how to do that, but like that's all I want to do. So you just jumped into it from a from a real sort of interest standpoint, like, oh, I could just, I could do this. Somebody can, oh yeah, people do this. Like I should be one of those people. The things that you've subsequently done, like work with Eventide and stuff, have obviously tapped into some of your no- computer-based yeah. knowledge, which yeah. is interesting. It's kind of maybe a little full circle. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like the way most of us make music, like I love working on tape, um, but 
to be real, you know, like the majority of the projects that I do, and I think most other people making music in 2019, we spend a lot of time at the computer. Yeah. And even if we're not like putting in the code, there are those same sort of uh, analytical approaches. Like um, if, if I want to do this, then I should group these things this way or to maximize my processing or, you know, to have uh, in, infinite re recallability, you know, when somebody hits me up in two months and like asking for those minute changes. It's right. like the same sort of uh, analytical approach, I guess. Can you give me an example of, of one of those things? Yeah, I mean, the, so our studio, we don't have a console here. We had a, a Neve 5088 like Larry does. Um, we had that at Dr. Wu's, but you know, our, our loan was such, it's like, do we build out the studio or do we have a console? So, um, but we still have all this really fun outboard rack gear. So Jake and I will print our effects, whether it's like a hardware insert in Pro Tools or, you know, a, a tape or spring uh, print so that when we bring it back up, it's just another track of audio. I like personally grouping my stuff, um, you know, sort of like-minded things as if I'm preparing stems as we're working. It's like, okay, well, these like pads and this like washed out guitar part are all kind of doing this thing. So let me process this as like a group because I know that's how it's working in the mix. But also if somebody wants a stem or like I want to process them all together, they're all working, functioning the same way. Have you taken any of your workflow from more of an analog process and incorporated it to the digital realm? For sure, for sure. And I, I had this conversation with a, a friend uh, getting ready to work with this fall. Um, and he was talking about how on his previous record, he had, it was the first one he had done completely in the box because he had always come from tape and how he, he felt like he overworked it. You know, because it's like trying to get everything perfect, and and that was it, my my feeling is like just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, and so taking that sort of tape approach of well, how is the take? How does it feel? Like, does it sound good? And not to say that I don't edit things, like, but it's generally if something's bothersome, not just because it's slightly out you know like if i'm not trying to quantize everything to the grid it's like oh that hits early but it's otherwise a perfect take just, let's just nudge the hit um that kind of that kind of thing of using technology using the computer to do things that you couldn't do on tape like you couldn't splice right. just like the the bass guitar coming in slightly early you'd have to do the whole take but you can do it on that one track, so why not just do that and leave everything else cool because you were happy with the take at the time. Right. And like I, I do a lot of electronic music on my own um, and the, have been moving more and more into um, the sort of recording situation where I get a group of people in the room and you know we get a sound, get an idea, and hit record and see what sticks. You know, trying to get that first take, uh, like riding the rails kind of feel, mm -hmm. um, which is difficult in electronic music because so much of it is just right on the grid or, you know, like I've, I still do this often, but, you know, you come up with a loop and expand it and, you know, just sort of copy paste and to... To come at it from more of like the the old school approach of people in a room, even if it is just like a sampling drum machine and a direct bass and you know a bunch of synths, and you're getting that sort of weird and wobbly, like human touch to it. Yeah. And then to to edit it, I try to keep that same approach where it's not putting it on. I'm not trying to like quantize everything and put, put it back on the grid. I'm doing like the old school edit of, you know, like, oh, we went on like, what is, I guess, the equivalent of 12 bars. It would feel more natural if it's eight. Let me just like cut four or like, oh, what what she's doing over here feels like a chorus. 
wouldn't it be nice if it was up here and you know setting my marker based on like the hit of the drum machine and then dropping it in there even if i don't have it on a grid it's just sort of yeah. slip slip mode i guess right um yeah and i i so i guess it's looping back to your question all of these sort of old school approaches it's not that they're better because that's the way people used to do it it's in my mind it's better because it feels more human feels mm -hmm. more natural and is that stuff you're doing with eaters is that primarily the eaters a bit i have this new group called pe um and it's myself and one of the other members of eaters along with um a few members of the band pill that recently broke up um so it's that project started the uh three of us in the room here doing exactly what i described just like old emu sp12 sampling drum machine with mm. like a mic set up so we could record new samples and the piano was mic'd up and the bass was going through effects and you know just synths and spent a weekend jamming mm -hmm. and then start having people add to it and edit and all of a sudden songs start coming out of it yeah so no, then it's, it's just refinement yeah, at that point, a, an approach similar to what like Teo Macero used exactly. for, for like Bitches Brew and stuff, where yeah. they take performances and then create the arrangement and huge and inspiration. themes. Yeah, I mean, it, and and really, it has the the feeling of that it was sort of live, but then you have a repeating theme that's a cut, and uh, yeah. it's it's so, uh, it was very forward thinking at the time. You Absolutely, know? and you know, like Can is another, yeah, Can, yeah. and Eno we were talking yeah. about earlier, and you know, the, that's the kind of music I listen to on my own, right. and it's, it's, it goes back to the, like, just because you can doesn't mean you should. So like, how do, how can you like capture these ideas and then build them up instead of trying to fit them into you know a, a specific box yeah when i was in japan recently and and got into this idea that that uh the japanese have this concept that where their spaces exist for things to happen mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. the, the the potential is there right even though even though it's an empty room it's it's called Ma, I believe. The idea of silence and the use of silence and space and, but another concept is sort of like the idea of potential being there in the room. I think it's a, a really great application in music production, you know? Absolutely. And I, I, what you were talking about of like all the setup on the beginning and I, I, I spend so much of, the time, like what we would consider pre-production, thinking about the setup based on my conversations with people and, you know, that first day, I I still get like anxious and like, oh, it's taking too long, it's taking yeah. too long. But like, I, I have come to embrace that of like, okay, well, this is just part of what happens on day one. But I guess going back to like the whole systems engineering yeah. mind as yeah. well of like, okay, well, I know we're going to want to try this and this worked out and based on like what she was saying. I want to make sure we have that available in case like she wants to jump into that. And um, then you don't have to think about it the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, the way I think about it is like I've learned, you know, I went to Cleveland Institute of Music. I learned how to do like, proper mic placement for classical stuff. I worked with like jazz ensembles and did live sound and sound for film and post-production and just have done all these different things that like maybe I don't use them anymore, but it's just like a, a, a trick in the tool bag so I don't have to think about it. And then I can think about whether it's me making music or you making music, it's like, what are we trying to do here? And you can get into the philosophical and emotional aspect of like, what if you, you know, didn't play on the one and you were playing more on the two and supporting what he's doing on saxophone over there, you right. know, and, and, and listen from more of like a observational standpoint instead of like freaking out about like, uh, well, the, the mic needs to be like this. It's like the mic's, mic's fine. Yeah. Sounds great. My favorite recordings are the ones where 
I'm producing start to finish and, you know, able to have the conversations with the, the group or the artist before we even start and talk about like what we're going for and then record it in such a way to move things in that direction. And so when it gets to the mix, we have everything sort of, you know, it's like you're getting all your ducks in a row, I guess, from the beginning. Um, but it, a lot of the work that I do is mixing only or mixing and mastering where somebody else, whether it's an artist or a different engineer has recorded it and it's coming to me. And I'm, first thing I do is usually like mute a bunch of the drum mics. It's like, I don't need all these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like what sounds coolest? What has the best vibe? What's like exciting to me hearing it? I don't need, you know, three mics on the snare. So do, do you have um, a conversation and set expectations beforehand? With a mix uh, with or a, with? On a mix um, with people or, um, I, I've personally run into, and I know many other people have, where somebody says, yeah, I really want you to do your thing, you know, so we, we're, you know, you're, we want you to, we love your mixing. Yeah. I love this record, I love that record, whatever. And then you get in there and you mute a bunch of stuff and you're like, and then you get her like, where's the, yeah. where's the, where's my guitar in the verse? You know, it's like, you know, and it, a lot of times that stuff that they've tracked themselves and right. they haven't had somebody sort of helping them with arrangements, exactly. but they've become, they've become very married to it. Um, and it becomes a, it's a problem, you know, yeah. because you, 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 you do a lot of work and you obviously have, you know, an expertise and you're a fresh set of ears and sounding board. Yeah. No, I, I definitely have run into that. And uh, this building that we're in, there's like, I think 15 studios. So it's a, it's a cool community. And one of the other engineers in the building was telling me that he always provides options. He's like, even if they're not that different, even if I know like option B is the best one, I'll always give the other one. So when I do get into mixing, cause I, I can't help but tweak the arrangement. You know, it's like, I'm coming at it from that outside perspective, but also just like a producer's mind, even if I didn't track it, even if I'm halfway around the world, still like, oh, you know what? If this thing came in at this moment, it would help elevate it and make that chorus, you know, give the chorus a lift that doesn't need to like be hanging out before or after. And so what I'll do is I'll print a mix with the arrangement they gave me and then like, here's my idea of the edit. Right. And a lot of times people choose like, go in the direction that we've got, especially if it's someone I've built a rapport with. Right. But I would say like uh, a fair amount of times people are like, no, 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 that, that acoustic guitar needs to go throughout the entire time. And yeah. Like, oh, okay. Okay. All right. You're right. You insist. And I feel like a lot of people in tape hop touch on this of like the more and more of the production is moving into the artist. And that's an amazing and so much of how I got good at what I did was making my own records and like fumbling and, you know, having the other people in my band be like, I don't know, man, this doesn't sound that good. And like going back and, you know, trying another pass on the mix. And, but I think that outside perspective that we're talking about, you know, it's, it's healthy, even if you say no no, I don't want to do it that way. At least there's someone else coming in and being, you know, listening to your song with, with the mindset, with the ears of having done it many times with, for other people. Yeah. And as a listener and as a listener, I mean, I think that's the most important thing, right? Is that uh, to me, that's like one of the most important jobs of a producer is really just being a, a, a super listener with the option of making changes. I mean, it, yeah, it's like, no. Yeah. And it goes back to the earlier point of like, you learn the technical things so you don't have to think about them and right. you can listen as a listener. And it's like, yo, you know, I want, it feels like this bridge should be taking us somewhere else. You know, like, do we have it come earlier? Do we play with the arrangement? But like, you know, you're, you're listening right. as, as like a surrogate for the future audience. Yeah, I have a hard time and, and have modified my personal workflow is I, if I'm going to produce something, I always have like a friend 
engineer it. It took me so long to realize that, you know, just be like, yeah. you know what, I, I can't, I can't serve the artist as well. I, I have to join the band. I mean, I hear that. I, I, and I, I don't, I wish I had like a, a piece of advice or uh, beyond just like learn as much as you can so you don't have to think about it, you know, but I don't know how I'm able to balance that. You know, people, people talk about like, well, how do you master your own mixes? And it's like, I don't know, space, like don't listen to it for a while and then come back and be yeah. like, oh, this needs to be tweaked. But I, they're just, unfortunately, like isn't the budget to hire assistants or additional engineers for the majority of the projects that I work on. So it's just like, all right, well, right. how many hats do you need me to wear? And, you know, like end yeah. up with a stack on top. Um, but I'm okay with that. I think it's fun. And yeah, you get to join the band, but also like be the weirdo in the other room, like on the talk back, you know, with, with eaters and with PE. I mean, I, when I, when I listen to the eaters, sometimes that stuff gets like pushed out into the extremes, you know, I feel like doing your own projects is probably pretty healthy in terms of getting a lot of stuff out of your system and for being sure. able to do things and have an outlet for that stuff that maybe wouldn't be, you know, might end up on someone else's record otherwise. Yeah, no, I, and I, I, yes, I absolutely agree. And I, I had a, a client really early on be like, make a comment about how happy he was that I had my own recording projects he's like you know you're listening to it as a musician and you know you're responding to what i'm doing as someone who makes their own music and i think that it, that is really healthy but exactly what you're saying as well of like i get to spend the hours chasing a sound that i wouldn't necessarily do with a client you know of like well, hold on, hold on. I have this idea in my head. Let me just like keep working on this because you know we're on the clock and right. people get bored. But then if I learn it on my own, I can show someone or use it on someone else's record. Oh, check this out! Like I did this thing, and you know we don't have to like go through the trial and error so much. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think for for me it's it's a certainly a pressure release. I I like to keep busy. <laughs> I, yeah, and, I and there's it's very different making your own record than making records for other people. Like I certainly invest a lot of myself into the records that I produce, the records I mix too, you know. But especially the things that end up taking weeks or months of our collective time. Like I'm I'm invested, but having having those own things of like. Well, I don't care if everything's running through guitar pedals. Like, it sounds cool. Let's, yeah, yeah. Let's, like, keep going with that. Yeah, I see the radio stuff over there. Uh, oh, yeah. The, we the we have... The ecstasies or... Yeah, these uh, ecstasies, the things to go from the patch bay out into pedals. Like, yeah. we started with two, and then Jake bought one, and then I bought another one. So now we can go dual stereo or, yeah. or you know. It, those things get used all the time. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a way to get very sort of different things happening. Yeah, Not, you know because I, especially in the world today of like plugins and presets and like you turn on the radio now and it's like that you you know as a record maker what they you know a they didn't necessarily go the extra mile right they just use the pre oh, put it on and no one's gonna know and that's true you know no one knows but. You sort of like start sounding a little samey, you know, you start hearing the same things over and over again. Or Fruity Loops is like the, you know, that vocal patch, the, right. you know, the pseudo auto tune, the Travis Scott, you know. Yeah, thing. Houston. Houston, it's all Houston, <laughs> super Houston. Uh, but I think what where you're going with this goes back to our earlier conversation about the analog techniques of um, like committing to a sound. Uh, you know, when you're going through a pedal or a tape echo or a spring reverb, you know, that you have to commit it because it's, there's no recall on most of the pedals. Um, and, you know, you have to use your ears. It's not like you can tempo sync the, the tape echo to your, right. your uh, session file. So I think that, that it, it changes the way you listen 
but also the way in which you approach the record. And that's, that's why I love working on tape, even if it all ends up in the computer at the end, you know, doing those basic takes where we're collectively all just listening and we're not looking and it's not like, well, could we take the verse of this and combine it with the chorus of this other take and then go back there? Like that has its time and place for sure. I do that often, but if it's a band, if it's, or, you know, like a, a situation where you're working to capture that interaction of people, I love tracking the tape because, you know, you're, we're all just in that moment and it's like thumbs up, thumbs down, try it again. Yeah. Well, it changes the way that you are engaged. Yeah. Without the sort of safety net. Yeah. Of like, oh yeah, we'll just yeah. fix it. So, you know, like people aren't looking at this, but there's just piles of pedals everywhere. And, you know, I ended up bringing, like digging through a crate and finding an eight channel, like TS snake for all of the ecstasies. Cause we were constantly, they were just like piles of cables on top right. of everything. And it's like, oh, well here's like one big one. Yeah, we're yeah. going to use this every day. But yeah, having, having those, I always gravitate toward it, especially now, because I spend so much time at the computer. It's like, if I can just grab a knob and twist it, I'm going to be way happier than if I'm going to sit there and like click over and over. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. I got plenty of that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of studios, there are a bunch of studios right here in this building and mm -hmm. Studio G over here. You got a ton of other strange studios weathers down strange the block. weathers down the street. I'm, you know, the, the, you know, any number of studios around. How are you finding work? Well, work has been good. We, Jake and I have been, uh, we started building out the studio about two years ago. Like I got a, a reminder on Instagram the other day of like me and my contractor building out enclosures for the electrical sockets. And it's like, yo, Kyle, can you believe this is two years? Um, Jake and I had been working at Woos for a while and things were going well and both Jake and I have our own client base and are constantly working on stuff but that that's what encouraged us to take the leap with this is i've worked with with jake for so many years now and we lived together and he got married uh and while we were living together and so like he and his wife and i were all together like he's family and so right. there's a there's that faith that like, well, I know he's got my back and he knows I got my, his back. I feel like both of us are, we're deep enough into our careers to also have the faith that we'll continue to grow and bring people in. But I, I'll say like the last year and a half since the studio has been up and running has been the most productive period of my life. And even if I'm not working on other people's stuff, you know, I'm having eaters or PE come in or like I'm working on a record with my buddy Austin, um, you know, and just using the space. It's like manifest destiny, I guess, of like, OK, well, I have it. I may as well use it now. Right. And have been consequently making a lot more music in the space than than I did before, where it was like, oh, maybe we can get in here for like a couple hours around people. It's like. No, I, I, it's my space. If Jake's not using it, I can use it. And I think that just like the, the more you put in, the more comes back to you as well. Yeah. It's funny. It's, you know, with the, the cycles of release, everything sort of gets bunched in like fall and spring. So even though like the last month I feel like has been pretty mellow for me, all these releases that I worked on, you know, over the past year are like coming out in rapid succession and run into people who are like, dude, you've been busy. And it's like, oh, yeah, I guess like, you know, long view. Yeah. It has been a lot of stuff. Right. Um, and and that's that's always a nice reminder, too. Um, I don't know. I guess like in in terms of the ebb and flow of freelance, it's it's just a real thing like I've been doing this for 15 years I've been freelance for 15 years and um, it used to really freak me out when I didn't have work for you know a couple weeks or a month on end and you know then you'd be in the thick of it and be freaking out like oh man 
I wish I had time to like finish that song I started or, you know, like go to go out of town for the weekend or like cook a meal for myself or whatever. And then I think it really was having the studio up because it's really only within the last couple of years that I'm chill about the ebbs. And it's like, oh, yeah, I, I will finish that record that I started last time I had free time. And right. I will go out of town and I will like cook three meals for myself. Right, today. right. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like I and it, I, I guess that's like the the best advice just to, in terms of headspace of if you really are trying to make it in this business, just, you know, work as hard as you can, but don't like beat yourself up if you end up with free time because it's, it's, ne it's never going to be constant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're also seems like you're keeping yourself busy with projects that are musical, but not records. Yeah. You know, you, with the Eaters, you've done a couple art installation type pieces. Can you talk a little bit about the, those or one For of those? For sure. Yeah. So Eaters is a project that um, I started with uh, my friend Bob Jones back in 2012. And it's just been, it started as a studio project. And then as we had a record worth of material that was coming out, started performing live and I brought in a friend of mine that I had gone to school with who's a, a glass sculptor. He's not a musician, but it, just this incredibly gifted artist. Um, and he and I had toured him doing visuals and me doing front of house for people. And so I brought him into the fold to do what he calls kinetic light sculptures. And so he designed these different sculptures to perform while we were performing music. Um, and from there, it, it became more of a collaboration in terms of building sound sculptures. Like we have this one piece called Moment of Inertia that is a prepared turntable. Like there's no motor. It's just like a, it looks like a layer cake of glass on uh, like a industrial potter's wheel. And so you spin it and get it up to speed and there's a record on top um, that we had specially cut so that as the, the turntable slows down over a period of like seven minutes, the, the music um, you know, just naturally slows down. So what we, we had it cut so that it speeds up. Like I had in Ableton, I had it, the, the thing <laughs> speed up and then had a special acetate cut so that as the record is speeding up but the turntable is slowing down, you get this weird sort of like up and down, up and down um, tempo thing that eventually just dies. But you can hear the pitch constantly going down. So things like this that are just like really fun experiments. Uh, what we're working on right now is um, made a record in here where... Uh, Chris, the visual artist, brought in a glass harmonica that he had made. And a glass harmonica is a... Benjamin Franklin was actually the person that conceived of it, but it's a principle of running your finger around the rim of a mm. glass to make it resonate. But it's, a, it's an instrument where it's a bunch of nested dishes around like a central rotating like spit, basically. And so you dip your fingers in the water and you can play chords or melodies mm. instead of just like two things at a time. Wow. Um, so Chris built this, but it wasn't on a scale. It was just like, these sound cool together. This one's rainbow. This one, <laughs> I etched a zoetrope into it. So when you flash a strobe, it looks like it's melting. And he played it for Bob and I, and Bob was like, dude, you built a microtonal drone machine. So we, we've been doing these sets where he plays the harmonica and we play a process sense and uh, Bob's uh, classically trained in double bass. So we've experimented with that as well. Just sort of not trying to make songs, just like well, what seems fun. Yeah, oh, uh, that's so cool. I'd love to hear that. Um, Bob from Eaters is also in this project. It started as a improvised like one-off set for a friend's record release show. And we had so much fun doing it. They were, came into the studio for a weekend and just jammed, like I was saying. And then um, a few of the members were in a band called Pill, 
who had a record come out uh, fall 2017. Wait, what year is it? No, 2018. Um, and so they got busy and it just sat on my hard drive for like six months. And then over the winter, we all got back together and made this record. And especially once Pill broke up, it's like, okay, well, like this, this feels hot. This feels exciting. Let's go here. And that's been really fun and liberating. Like I play MS-20 and I sing through a ring mod on stage. You know, it's like, wow. That's all I ever wanted. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. But you know, it's it it's been because it came from a place of improvisation, and because Bob and I had tried to retrofit the studio creation with Eaters to the stage, like with Eaters, and I feel like with a lot of live electronic music, it becomes very scripted, and you know. Even, even if you're not playing to a backing track and you're queuing up loops and samples live, you know, we, we sort of painted ourselves into this corner where the, quote, best performance was the most technically accurate. So you're just trying to, like, hit your marks, which has its own validation and appeal, but after a while, that gets kind of old. Oh, so for you. For me. For yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, and my bandmate. Um, but... With PE, we really were trying to keep that spirit of improvisation intact. And, you know, so still chopping up loops and samples, but feeding them into an octa track so that it's really fluid. And, you know, it's like sampler, synths, bass guitar, saxophone vocals, you know. And I don't think we've played the same song twice the same way. You know, it's, every time it's just sort of like what's happening on stage. Mm -hmm. And that's been really liberating and exciting. And certainly, like, for me, having those experiences encourages the way I approach the recording. So it's like, no, trust me, this will be fun. Like, let's, yeah, yeah. let's go off on the limb a little bit. And, like, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe it gets a little shaky, a little weird. We can always, like, go back to the, the trunk if we need to. Do you think that people are coming to you for a certain thing? I mean, are, I mean you've, you have a liturgy record. And then you have like a drums record, mm -hmm. and then you have like a. I mean, just, the parquet chord stuff. Yeah, I the still get a lot of people hit me up. They're like, I want it to sound like parquet chords. And it's like, well, you don't really sound like parquet chords. Right. So, so, what is your. They're very, those are some pretty, of your catalog, I sort of feel like you got like this sort of dirgy indie metal band. And yeah. And you've got some stuff that's a little more drum machine y and sort yeah. of pop. You know, it leans more yeah, pop. It's not pop music, for sure. but. Um, yeah, they're pretty different. Absolutely. Um, they may not even seem like things that the same guy would do. So. No, I get a lot of people that are confused when they look at my discography. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, for me, it's like I want to keep interested. Like it's part of that is you know very much like self fulfilling of like well I don't want to I don't want to get pigeonholed. I don't want to do like eight track you know like scrappy punk records the rest of my life like right. I love doing those but there's so much more and especially the older I get and the longer I do this it it really is like well a does it seem like there's something I can really sink my teeth into here whether it's metal or pop or something completely different but also like do I like the people do I want to be in a room with this group of people you know, sharing our creative and emotional energies for an extended period of time. Um, but I think ultimately, like, it does all kind of influence one another. Like, you know, I, I learned so much about tape doing those parquet courts and uh, Ferguson Geronimo records of, um, you know, like the, those uh, sunbathing animal and uh, light up gold and tally all the things that you broke, like, those were done on eight track tape. My drums are a stereo pair, like sub mix down. You know, like, does this drum sound good to you? Cool, because that's the way it sounds now. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we can EQ and compress it differently, but like, are, are you, this is what it is. Right. Um, and, you know, maybe with some of the more like ornate records, we have a bunch more mics that we can use, but 
that same sort of commit. Like, are you happy with this? Sounds good to me. Let's move forward. And I, you know, it's, I feel like the the fastest way to kill the momentum is when you start like a being like the different different mics, different EQ. Like, there's a time and a place for that, but once it gets going, don't change it unless it sounds bad. I guess I. I took a pretty hard tangent from your initial question, but I think my my production approach in general is, I think we touched on it earlier, you know, coming from a fan as a, a, a listener and just what do I want to hear and trying to connect with the artist on a, an emotional level about what they're trying to do with their song, you know, like, does this chorus serve its purpose? And like, or rather, how can we have the arrangement serve the chorus? And cut, you know, pulling from that technical bag of tricks to throw things at the song to make it compelling. Mm -hmm. Part of the fun for me is pushing those different boundaries of how one makes a record. You know, whether we're documenting the band live to tape or we're doing like a synth metal opus or you know just like a weird microtonal drone record that you know I'm just going to record a bunch of stuff and then edit the pieces to make it feel like coherent movement and you know it, it's but I think ultimately it comes back to using using your ears in the moment and trying to get something that everyone's excited about and then committing and moving forward so you can get to the actual music making. That's a, there's a huge element of trust in that. Yes. We can have all these conversations beforehand, but then when we actually like have the studio booked and we're starting a record, you know, it's like, all right, let's all grab hands and jump off that cliff together, you know, and like, we'll, we'll land, trust me, we'll, we'll land down there and it'll be cool and we'll have a record to show for it. But, you know that whole like dive down it's just like all right dude i'm i'm following your lead on this and yeah it doesn't always work out you know sometimes like attitudes or you know are are such that we don't work well together and sometimes a person's perception of what they're going for is so rigid that it doesn't matter if it's me or anyone else like they kind of need to be calling the shots but by and large, you know, it, it is ultimately about communication. And that's why I love the records where we can have those conversations before we even set foot in the studio. So that, you know, I'm working to get in your head space. And we're the, because we've had these conversations, we can all move toward a common goal. Even if you can't express it directly, I can filter something and put out ideas and then based on what you respond we can pivot from there and see where it takes us that's a big part of the fun of making records is that you don't actually know what you're going to get until the end of it yeah i think that there that is a huge part of it is like when somebody says well what's it going to be like I, I don't know yeah i don't know i know it'll be good because we we're doing it together yeah <laughs> as people are deciding who to work with it maybe should be not so much well i liked your record that it made it's sort of like are are we good with each other are we cool yeah. can we hang exactly I mean, do i want to hang out do i want to spend all this time in a room with you trying to get on the same level yeah. yeah yeah i love i love being able to meet with with bands you know whether they're based in New York and like go out have them over at the studio or they're on tour and like go see a show and step out you know for a bite and just have a 45 minute conversation like you know whether it's going to work after that you right. know when you when you either like know exactly what the path is going to be or are so fixated with the couple steps directly ahead of you then you know you're missing all the the, the fun tangents and like fields and uh, you know, mountains that are off to the side of the path that, you know, maybe, maybe that's where you ought to go. Yeah. <laughs>
That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's how I think about it. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> well, I think we're good, man. All right. Yeah, that was a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Find us online at tapebop.com, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time. <laughs>